We continue on and talk more about the atmosphere here and specifically now turn our focus to temperature in the lower atmosphere. And so we have this another image showing us our annual average temperature uh, and we'll come back to that later in this lecture and talk more about that. But since we're talking about temperature, our song to get us in the mood for this lecture is going to be Hot and Cold by Katy Perry. So hopefully you're familiar with the general concept of temperature, but for to give us some sort of definition for what temperature actually is, it uh, hope we can note that it is the measurement of kinetic energy. So to note that as our temperature increases, what that really is measuring uh, by our instrument on, our, on the right that we most commonly use, our thermometer, is that it's measuring that kinetic energy is going up and molecules are expanding, they're becoming more active, they're bouncing around more. And in, um, as temperature decreases, the kinetic energy of those molecules goes down. Um, so again, I'm thinking of this in the terms of gases that are bouncing all around us, but this also refers to liquids so like water or uh, solids as well. So generally the kinetic energy that's being measured, regardless of any of those states of matter, I mean, you know, molecules kind of expand um, as temperature increases and molecules contract uh, as temperature or, or shrink as temperature decreases. Again, so thermometers is just one way that we can use uh, to, re to uh, measure that. Um, and generally the thermometers use one of three main recognized scales, probably two of which you're familiar with, hopefully, um, to some degree. So if you've grown up in the United States, you're probably most familiar with the Fahrenheit scale. Um, but the Celsius scale is the, probably the scale that's used most worldwide and is used in most uh, academic or other kind of scientific measurements. Um, so we'll see, we, you know, we'll through the rest of this course, see many measurements made in temperature uh, Celsius. Uh, but also there's a Kelvin scale, um, which I um, have provided you in the lesson uh, as well, that, that um, has an absolute zero value. So essentially, this is, is this kind of theoretical temperature. That would be the very coldest we could ever reach, where actually kinetic energy um, would kind of cease in theory. And we've never really reached that even in uh, physics and chemistries that try to produce that. Um, but again, that's kind of beyond the scope of our interest. But again, just to note that that is another uh, type of scale to use for temperature measurement. Um, but again, we've talked a little bit through this before, but just to re, re uh, go over some of this, um, to note that we have this, these, we can see these, uh, once again, with our four scales, or excuse me, four layers of the atmosphere here that we uh, had based on temperature. And so generally noting that temperature decreases um, with altitude as we increase, at least in the troposphere, that first layer closest to uh, the ground and then going up, we, can, we have the stratosphere, the mesosphere, and the thermosphere um, going out to the very outest layers of what we consider Earth's atmosphere. Um, and again, generally we're seeing this temperature decrease, um, but we haven't really talked about why we actually have this temperature generally getting colder with higher altitudes uh, above the Earth. And that is related to another concept which we're going to move to talk about in this lecture and in, and in, in future lectures as well, and this idea of atmospheric pressure. So we can see on that same image on the right, again, that red line is representing temperature, but that blue line is representing pressure. And we see, again, once again, it, um, even more than the temperature, which goes down through the troposphere and then actually kind of levels out, maybe even warms up a little bit um, in the stratosphere. Um, but then continues to decrease in the mesosphere and up. Um, you know, note here that we uh, have again on the the pressure again com compared to that just continually decreases as we go up and up and up in the atmosphere. Um, and really, um, you know, just to note that um, you know, what is important about this is that the, this air exercises its weight or it kind of has a pressure to it. Um, the number of molecules is really what we're seeing here. And so the air pressure is greater near the surface of the Earth or is greatest really at the lowest elevations, whether that's sea level or even in some places even below sea level, um, and then decreases and de the higher and higher we go in elevation uh, as we would consider on the ground or altitude as we consider in the air. Um, either one of those, you know, as we continue to go up above our surface, we get less and less and less air pressure because really gravity is affecting all those air particles that we see bouncing around in the atmosphere. So I'm showing on this image on the left hand side kind of we can see the greatest number of air molecules kind of per volume of air around us um, are greatest at sea level or lowest elevations and then as we go up and up and up again elevation referring to being on land altitude 
in the air, but regardless, either one, as you go further up, um, you get less and less air pressure there. And so that we feel that in then terms of temperature, especially when you get to these really, really high altitudes. Um, so, you know, near the top of the troposphere and really beyond that. So in the sense that um, we see through that stratosphere that the temperature warms maybe to some small extent, but actually, if we were to go up there in terms of our own sensibility to uh, heat, um, we would actually feel it really be colder and colder um, as the further we you go up because um, you know, this air pressure that's around, you know, kind of how we perceive and really feel that heat is in part tied to really the amount of air pressure there is. And so if there's so limited amount of air pressure, to some extent, um, more and more, we're going to just generally kind of feel that as colder and colder. We're not going to have feel those molecules, um, again, that are exerting some air pressure on us as they are more down at elevations that really humans are used to living within, um, in the, in the troposphere. And, you know, um, again, we won't, we will, you wouldn't perceive, uh, be able to perceive that, you know, sensible heat the further and further you went up in the atmosphere. So this is going to be important, um, for us to look at uh, this air pressure in the atmosphere because um, when we're talking about this rate of change with temperature with height, we're going to note that there's essentially two components uh, that we're, we're going to be interested in, in in many coming lectures. One is what we can term the environmental lapse rate, and so really this is showing that kind of just generally um, moving up within the atmosphere here, um, as we can see by those images uh, on the right here. So this degrees as we see them uh, going up kind of just the atmosphere around and um, you know again as we go up in the atmosphere there's some decrease in temperature uh, per the amount of rate of change or how much distance we up we change by so much uh, temperature or decrease in this case um, but there's also we're going to be looking a lot at kind of using this concept of the air parcel um, so you know and that's what they represented by these bubbles here in these pictures it's kind of like a different air mass kind of that we can say is contained within and then are kind of surrounded by that local environment uh, or that local environmental lapse rate. Um, and so basically the idea is that the local environmental lapse rate is changing at a different rate uh, than that air parcel. And that's going to be important because, um, you know, we can just to back up, I guess, to, and finish that thought. So the, the air parcel, just to note, again, in this case, we can think of, you know, as some volume of, of air um, you know, relatively sizable, um, and meaning, you know, anywhere at a minimal size, let's just say kind of abstractly something like the size of a house, but I mean, it can be up to a much, much larger than that, much er larger area that could be kilometers to miles across uh, or kind of in volume. Um, but the idea here, again, being that um, really we have these two different air masses to say and that the relation between the two of them is going to determine what we term either stability or instability of that air and so really what that means is that's referring to the tendency for that parcel of air to remain in place or for it to rise and so the short of it would be that a stable air mass has more like is essentially going to likely remain in place where an unstable air mass is likely to continue rising within uh, the atmosphere. Uh, and so um, we'll come back to that in a, in a minute, but really want to note that, um, as we've already talked about a little bit, so noting that air that is rising, again, as we're seeing, um, knowing that it's cooling as we go up and up in the atmosphere, um, so note that it's, calling, it's cooling at what we term adiabatically, and that air that is then sinking back to the surface because it's going the opposite direction, it's warming, it is warming adiabatically. And so what we mean by that is to play off these words as I have on the slide of diabatic and adiabatic, um, to note that a diabatic process is actually what we've kind of already looked at with uh, a num in, in a number of past lectures, or where we'll be referring to a process where it requires energy to change temperature. So when we looked at the pot of water that we placed on the lit stove, that was warming adiabatically. We were applying energy to it, to that pot, in the form of uh, heat from the stove. That is a diabatic process. Um, similarly, insulation coming in from the sun, you know, warming the Earth's surface, you know, being absorbed by the Earth's surface or the atmosphere. That is a diabatic process. What we're referring to here, uh, you know, adiabatic, adiabatic process, meaning that it is not diabatic or diabatic. It is um, 
it is a temperature that um, what we're seeing changing, but where no heat or no energy is being added or removed. All right, so the key idea here is that temperature change is not just based on that energy addition or you know, um, absorption or releasing, but it can also change in the sense of uh, the, the air that we're studying here in terms of the lower atmosphere. Um, we can also have a change in air pressure cause a change in temperature. So the idea um, is you know, we saw on the previous slides of particles you know, being most dense uh, at the near, or at lowest lower and elevations or altitudes and becoming less dense um, as the higher and higher you go you note that that if air press particles are pressed together um, and that volume of the uh, parcel then decreases and in because there's more and more collisions as we talked about in, in the previous slide how we, we feel that more and more collisions as more heat um, is actually why we're perceiving that and then actually seeing this measurable change or an increase in temperature. And conversely, if we were then say ri rising air, um, having rising air within the atmosphere, um, those particles then, because they're going up, um, they are expanding and you know, there's not as much air pressure they're able to move out. Um, that volume increases of that bubble or that air parcel. And there are fewer collisions between molecules, again, leading to this actual measurable decrease in temperature. So again, to bring this back to this, this image that we saw a couple slides ago now, um, to note that stable air um, is where a parcel of air then will be cooling faster than the surrounding air. And so we can see this on the left-hand side. So again, where um, that parcel of air um, means, you know, we can see that they start, both the parcel of air and the air around it here start at the same uh, temperature, but as they rise, um, because the parcel of air cools faster, and it is a colder temperature here than its surrounding um, air environmental lapse rate, um, because of that, this air would tend to remain stable, actually wouldn't continue to go up in the atmosphere unless by forced by some other mechanism, which we will talk about some of those in the future lectures, but right now we're not going to worry about those. Um, and so just to note that because of this, because the air is, uh, is colder and thus uh, has a tendency to be more dense, um, that air would essentially sink back down to the Earth's surface, really wouldn't have any reason um, on its own to move up within the atmosphere. However, take the opposite condition, since the unstable air is kind of when our situation is reversed. So knowing that when the surrounding air or that you know, that environmental lapse rate, as we would term it, cools faster than the parcel of air, um, now we have the condition where we end up seeing another you know, unstable air that, um, again, our temperature around um, our in that, in the, by the environmental lapse rate, ends up being colder than, again, the warmer air within the parcel because that air now in the parcel is warmer compared to its surroundings. It is going to be, um, it is less dense than that air, air surrounding it, and it's going to be more, have since you more buoyancy to it, it's going to have this, um, and be able then to continue to rise up within the atmosphere. Um, and so again, we'll revisit this and actually talk um, and why this is so important for a number of other processes in the coming lectures as well. But that gets us to uh, through some of this main concept for now. And so note that I'm um, really, you know, we could we looked at temperature, we looked at air pressure. And you know, just to know how we measure that, how we actually know how uh, air temperature and pressure change within our, our lower atmosphere. Um, one of the most popular, really the main instrument we use to say um, is a, this instrument known as the radio sound. Um, and so there's some links here and you can find out more about how those exactly are used. But essentially they're these light balloons that have instruments on them that can measure things like temperature and air pressure um, and that help better inform us of the conditions of the atmosphere. And again, we'll come to recognize where that's more important with things like weather uh, that we oftentimes have interest in. But um, you can follow the links here and show the, show you know, a map of you know, network across the world of where radio sounds are used to measure temperatures um, and you know, covering all the continents. So to that is to note that we've gone now through all this and to say, okay, well, generally the conditions are always that in the, in the troposphere as our, our main focus is in the atmosphere, that uh, temperature always decreases um, with uh, increased elevation or altitude within the atmosphere. Um, but that it, you know, now we can actually complicate that and say, complicate that uh, and say, well, actually that's not 
always true. Um, actually, in some specific cases, um, specific locations, um, based with the right conditions, um, we can actually have what we term a temperature inversion, or essentially where we reverse those conditions and we actually have an increase in temperature with height, um, usually at some uh, height or distance um, for several hundred meters perhaps or a kilometer or two even um, within the uh, atmosphere. So there's several reasons why this can happen. Um, I've again put some links here and you can read more about um, some of those reasons that occur. Um, but a couple of the main reasons that we see for temperature inversions are um, when there's a cooling of air um, near Earth's surface at night, um, and there's not really much convection or, again, moving around of that air. Um, you can actually have a warmer layer um, end up forming above it and um, essentially being in that colder air being trapped in below it. Um, and so this is also similar. Um, in another main condition is air subsidence. So if you have sinking air, um, that kind of um, have colder air that sorts itself out at night, um, particularly, and ends up sinking down into lower uh, elevations, um, that can create a warmer, uh, essentially, cap above it. Um, and so this is important, especially in parts of the western United States. Um, you can get quite um, strong and lasting uh, of these temperature inversions for quite uh, a length of time, um, usually especially in the winter months, um, as shown by the image here on the right. Um, and that actually can be really problematic then um, because it can cause a lot of the pollution that may be um, released by um, things like um, burning fossil fuels from cars and other kind of human activities um, to become trapped within um, really this lower uh, altitude and really kind of circulate and kind of cause air quality to be very bad um, until that, that temperature inversion breaks up. So, you know, the, again, the, the, it's convection or that advection of air, um, usually that helps then break up an inversion and, and you know, kind of cycle it around more and push it out. Um, but again, when in the absence of really air moving, um, where we don't really have wind, as we'll be talking about in, in a future lecture, um, you know, we end up uh, not having... Uh, these you know, that air moving around more likely to form a temperature inversion. So we can actually also get these to you know to look at here. Um, here's an example from uh, Eugene, actually an inversion in the Willamette Valley. So this view is from Spencer Butte. You know, if you've been up on Spencer Butte, and to note that um, you can, this view normally happens in the winter time. Um, so this uh, photo um, actually taken in December, where a condition where actually down in Eugene it was below freezing, um, but really we had this cap uh, we can see by the clouds, and actually the temperature above up on the Spencer Butte uh, summit was much much warmer um, on this particular morning um, where this when this was taken. And so to note, if we we can in show visually um, uh, and map, of course, and represent our surface temperature um, as we've done before. And so this is another uh, example of our average annual temperature uh, map showing for you know, temperatures across the whole Earth. But we want to note that you know, looking at this um, and, and kind of question, going back to some of that critical thinking with our maps and asking, well, what what are we showing here also, and, and, and what, how in possible ways might this be limit, limiting, you know, why, what are actually perhaps limitations of this. So, you know, to note, you know, again, this is annual temperature, so over the span of a year, and to note that within that year, of course, if, especially if we're moving towards the poles in either direction, we get more and more seasonality, and of course we're missing out then on that uh, monthly variation in our seasons, and so you might say, well, actually it makes more sense to have, you know, maybe map at a more monthly scale, uh, time scale, rather than uh, having a full yearly time scale that you know, misses out on how uh, temperature changes over that time period. And so, bring this back to using the Climbus um, animations here. So we have air temperature shown here, in this case for July. I mean, you can link, go to the link here, and this will have a, a GIF that cycles you through the 12 months of the year, and kind of the average temperature for those months based on a base period of temperatures from 1971 to 2000. And really, again, we're just interested in the pattern here to show us, you know, what are some of the main patterns that we observe of temperature changing over the course of a year, and based on some of the um, principal processes that we've already talked through in, in some 
past lectures. Um, but to note, you know, in, 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 um, through observations, so again, to flip through here, um, so we have July versus January, um, to note, if we flip back and forth between them a few times, we'll be looking at, for example, the Western United States, and seeing how much, um, particularly we can note that much of the land uh, temperature changes quite a lot in, in that range of temperature. Um, but actually by looking at the west coast, looking at the ocean just off the coast, you really actually don't see much temperature change at all. Um, and again, um, this is relatively coarse data, and we can actually see a, um uh, as in detail as we might like, uh, but even you know here we can start to say, well, yeah, it definitely seems like along those coasts the, in the oceans there really isn't as much change um, as compared to on land. And you know if we were to ask, well, okay, why? You know, question, well, why is that? Why is that right? Um, you know, there are the, you know that's tied to some of the reasons that we've already covered, and hope you know hopefully um, before. Um, you know, if, if I could ask you that question, you'd actually be able to reason out, oh, well, you know, um, we've already talked about specific heat and how water has a much higher specific heat than land. So, you know, water takes a lot more energy input to warm its temperature to the same extent that land um, require, you know, um, much less energy input to warm. And then also I'm tied to these concepts of latent heat and sensible heat where, you know, some of that energy gut goes into the ocean and it's going, and it's being absorbed by the oceans, um, is going to evaporation. So again, that's that latent heat of changing its state. It's not changing its temperature, um, versus, you know, on the land mass, pretty much all the energy uh, is going to um, heating or cooling, um, you know, if it's being released from those land masses. Again, so we see much greater change in a range of temperatures throughout the year on those land masses. And so as to say, again, of that energy absorbed um, and at the Earth's surface, um, note that because you know, the oceans are very extensive, um, they absorb and store uh, the largest proportion of the amount of energy that is being absorbed uh, at Earth's surface. And that's also to show that, again, with this relatively coarse data, kind of hard to see, but if we toggle back and forth between our January and our Ju July conditions in this case. I mean, we can see to some extent if you also run the full GIF through the whole year. But just to note that, you know, with isotherms, I um, generally see um, in the summer months, those extending on land masses much more northerly, um, war the warmer temperatures uh, as compared to out in the oceans, because again, that land mass, uh, the, the sun, even if it's, if it's at relatively low sun angle, it's up for a lot of hours of the day, um, that land mass heats up a lot quicker. And so, you know, those uh, warmer uh, isotherms are measurements, you know, lines of equal temperature in this case, um, extend a lot further north um, in, on land masses in the case of the southern hemisphere. Um, and then, kind of, you know, kind of in contrast, we end up having uh, our isotherms that go a lot further south um, than the same ones in the oceans uh, in the winter months, as we would term for the northern hemisphere, um, really because, again, once again, we're, we're seeing that land mass cool off a lot faster um, be in rather than compared to the oceans. And so again, we've talked through some now of these main broad scale temperature controls that I just wanted to keep us in mind. So not only latitude and based on that sun angle, um, as we covered earlier, but also elevation um, and land water heating differences, as you just covered in that last a few set slides. And so to note that, you know, as we'll continue to carry this forward and recognize, um, as we've already kind of have, but just to make explicit to us, to note that, you know, a reminder that, you know, so we're, we're seeing it, you know, kind of the equator and the tropics, I mean, experiencing a relatively small temperature range throughout a year um, with high average temperature then because we have very direct sun angle throughout the year you know and how that changes then as we move to higher and higher latitudes so when we move to those mid and higher latitudes we have a greater temperature throughout range throughout the year again based on both a, a greater variation of incoming solar radiation uh, so sun angle and that day length and so, you know, also to note that of what we've been talking about here, temperature range also is often much lower along a coast at the same latitude compared to an inland location because of that latent and specific heat characteristics that we just talked through.